start now. Good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of CAT's Center for Advancement of Traditional Building Technology and Skills, I welcome all the speakers and each one of you to the special play story session of Festival of Places 2020, jointly hosted by Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts, IGNC in New Delhi, and CATS. This Festival of Places is an idea born out of the spirit of volunteerism to come together, collaborate, co-create, and celebrate places that nurture health and happiness and foster community living. The Festival of Places aims to bring people, places, and memories and their interrelationships at the forefront of public discussion. It envisions to investigate places, the people who inhabit them, the collective and individual memories that are integral to places, and present them in a new way to leverage discussions on the future of public spaces. It provides an opportunity to people for sharing their personal narratives. Moreover, the festival aims to help discover the much overlooked human dimension of spaces. We at CATS feel very strongly about the dismal state of public spaces in our cities and firmly believe change in the way we think, talk, and use public spaces can only begin at the grassroots by creatively engaging people with places and empowering them to make a difference to the places and spaces around. The main highlight of the Festival of Places this year is Play Stories, a series of online storytelling sessions that will help understand the hidden dimensions multiple interpretations and varied memories associated with places, highlighting distinct characteristics of places, as well as unraveling the bond that people have with places, a connection that lives through their experiences. Special Play Story Session is a series of interesting storytelling sessions by subject experts from diverse fields. These sessions focused on public spaces have been planned around four pertinent themes. The, the theme for this uh, Special Play Story Session is the idea of public space as place. Public spaces are a great way for people to experience a city. They are one of the most essential building blocks of a city, giving the city both its character and substance. In its most generic form, a public space is a space set apart or used for specific purpose, defined both by tangible and intangible features arising out of the ideas and actions of people. While natural features and tangible human features such as buildings and streets delineate the space, Intangible features such as activity, interaction, and movement animate them. This gives public spaces a distinct identity and qualifies them as places that are more than spaces, more than geographic settings with physical characteristics. The way people interact with places forms their experience, and experiences over a period of time build up as memory of a place and represent the collective identity and culture of a city. This session will explore the idea of public space as place to bring out the diverse nuances of different types of public spaces set in distinct geographical and socio-cultural contexts. The presentations will investigate place identities that are constantly changing and evolving with time. The session will also explore the transformative urban processes that have an adverse impact on place identities and embedded collective memories of public spaces. We are happy to have with us this evening our speaker, Speakers, Ms. Nidhi Dandona, IUDI Secretary, DNCR, and Urban Design Head at School of Art and Architecture. Mr. Michael Stott, Director, Urbis, Urban Designer and Strategic Planner, and Regional Leader, Placemaking X. He will be representing our Knowledge Partner, Placemaking India today. And lastly, Mr. Azwaiz Jani, Senior Manager, Sustainable Cities and Transport, World Resources Institute, India. We begin with a play story by Ms. Nidhi Dandona now. Nidhi is an architect and an urban designer with master's in architecture from SCA Delhi. She is the secretary of the IUDI DNCR Center, currently a full-time faculty at Sushan School of Art and Architecture, where she's heading the master's in urban design program since its inception in 2014. She was one of the directors at Ram Jandona and Associates supervising design and urban conservation projects. Her experience includes urban design studies, urban conservation, redevelopment projects and architectural projects like institutional, religious, and healthcare buildings. Nidhi has a keen interest in urban extensions of Indian cities, urban conservation, and development around heritage and historic city codes. She has presented her research work both at national and international conferences. She also runs a line of furniture for kids called Child's Play in Gurgaon. I would now like to invite Nidhi to share with us her play story.
Uh, hope you can hear me uh, now, Uvichi. Sorry? Yeah, uh, Didi, your screen is visible. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Start uh, the first uh, session for the day uh, today. Uh, public spaces and places, and I'll be covering the memories of Delhi. So these are my encounters with uh, Delhi as a city since my childhood, and uh, I borrowed uh, pictures from uh, IUDI, my own uh, uh, albums, and other places to explore uh, how you know Delhi has changed in the past few years and uh, is again changing. Delhi as a city has changed, and I've been living here since childhood so these are memories of delhi and, and uh, still they are evolving so it's a journey ongoing journey i would say so what makes a space a place is the question we ask ourselves you know when we are in a public space so the in case of delhi you know we have these uh, objects in uh, space, mostly monuments, trees, and other objects that we see, which link the pe people and the space together. And we actually get a public space into in that space that we have. So there's use of uh, the public places. And uh, that's what gives a, a, a space a place, a meaning to itself. So there are uh, use and activities which goes on in these spaces, which give them uh, meaning. And Delhi being a very active, uh, socially active uh, city, you know, there are these uh, food stalls and activities which goes on in different spaces, which make it into a public, very vibrant public space. So there is always comfort and image uh, giving character to spaces, which makes it into a place. And you get the sense of place wherever you are. You know, this is of the jungle to where we have you know, which become spaces. Uh, uh, your voice is cracking a bit. They give rise to a place. This is Karuna. Nidhi, your, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, your voice is cracking a bit. Maybe you can try switching off your video and just do the screen share. Is my screen still visible? I think yes, yes, your screen is yes. there. Your screen yes. is very much there. Yeah. Yes. I think this will make it better. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. The sociability of the space makes it a, it a robust public space. And this, the Jama Masjid steps actually make this these steps into a vibrant public uh, place where people come, enjoy the monument, enjoy the space uh, around it. And then it, it's a lively place for interaction soci socially. In the background, you can see people are entering, people are gossiping, they are eating food, they are clicking pictures. So it's, this is a very vibrant public place because of the these steps and the monument and a live uh, place. These pictures have taken uh, at the Green Park uh, Metro Station. These have been clicked by Intac. These are the monuments in and around uh, Green Park and Hoskhas where uh, the monument itself is a lively example in our case where, you know, uh, children come uh, after school, they play. Mm -hmm. And the monument give monument and the space, the green space around it gives uh, rise to a memorable public space for these kids where they come every day and enjoy the space. The green spaces in and around Latians Delhi, if you see the way it has been mapped in the uh, plan, we the amount of green we have in the Latians uh, Delhi 
uh, forms a perfect background for uh, uh, spaces to become places, whether it's a green, natural green, or it's a space inspired by these greens. You know, we can see IIC on the left which is a very uh, live example done by Stein, you know, where the whole Lodi Garden and the IIC became a part of uh, the whole public space. And they, they, they both merge into each other. Then there are these green spaces which are natural and kept the way they are. That's Kutub where it's all the way it was and has been kept. We have the horse cars uh, monuments, which are uh, very well maintained and very popular with the, the public in Delhi. Again, you know, attaching memory, uh, the green, the uh, built heritage together and giving rise to a place. The cultural and regional context is a very important aspect uh, in case of Delhi, you know, where the green, the, uh, the culture, the tradition, uh, the natural environment, everything gives rise to the perfect uh, places that we have in Delhi. So the background of all these monuments is the seven cities of Delhi, you know, which are spread throughout uh, Delhi. We see these monuments uh, in and around wherever we go, even if you take a small swatch, if you see on the right of Hoskas, you know, and we start putting these red dots of all the monuments that we have uh, uh, in and around Delhi, you know, we have uh, uh, not, not just one or two, we have n number of monuments in, in a given site in Delhi. So they become a part of our memory and give a perfect background to all the places that we have. So the built heritage and, our peop and people are always connected by nostalgia and memory of the place and uh, the built uh, heritage that we have. These are some pictures again borrowed from IUDI, all the walk initiatives that we have done, which are very closely knit to memory, culture and uh, built heritage. The public space can also become a private corner if we choose to find our space in this place. You know, these are uh, again public spaces uh, close to monuments where uh, people have been sketching, writing, and uh, you know, getting their own space in the middle of a public place. Coming to all the vibrant markets in Delhi, I think Karol Bagh is a fine example where uh, all the vehicles have been asked to uh, stay on the main road and the pedestrian path, which is the main shopping spine has become uh, a pedestrian paradise, I would say. So this is uh, the scene now where all the vehicles have been moved and people are freely moving into a pedestrian place. So there are pause points, there are street hawkers, there are benches to relax on and you can just pause and have a look uh, at uh, whatever you want to. So it's a shopping paradise more than what it was earlier. Again, streets become places when there are processions and meetings and the whole uh, street becomes a, a live example where the vehicles are not there and be it becomes a place. This is a chabil uh, which is put when uh, the procession of Gurdwara takes place in Lajpat Nagar. These are some random pictures from my mobile. The street also becomes a place when it's a performance for a Nukkar Natak or a street performance. When it happens, that it becomes a place. Everybody takes a pause. They look at what's going on and it becomes a performance stage. The parking lot also can become a place of interaction, you know, when people pause and even the parking lot becomes a place and everybody's interacting. This is a, a parking lot in Steinabad uh, behind Chinmaya Mission, where again a discussion is happening and uh, a place can be formed where is, there is good interaction, there is light, there, is, um, uh, uh, there are people around. The villages and, and the street gives way to more pause points and interaction because of its scale. The, uh, if you see the uh, 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 earthen pots being sold by a person and all the people, uh, the old people come there, sit, they take a respite in uh, uh, this Shahpur Jat village. Uh, th this is a random picture next to a Nala where uh, these uh, people are, old people are sitting and you know, it's a p place for them in the middle of the, uh, village. Old uh, city Shah Jahanabad, you know, you if you look at these otlas where there is, uh, this is the first interface between the public and the house where people interact. There's a flower guy sitting there, there's a shop opening on the street. So that's the pl first, play, uh, first space where the public and the uh, community starts interacting with each other. It forms a small place. 
there is always fun and safety involved when you know you have these uh, places where uh, 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 children can interact they are comfortable they find it safe they find it fun coming to redevelopment plans in uh, delhi where a lot of things are reviving there is the sundar nursery which has come up there is this chandni chowk project where redevelopment is happening there is a historic water channel which is being revived and uh, this uh, this is the current picture now more work has gone, gone into uh, place now again revival work is going on so there is lot of nostalgia memory and people are going back to where they were once upon a time so spaces in front of the buildings can also turn into places like the flower market at baba khadak singh mark 4 o'clock in the morning this place becomes a flower market and then later during the day this is a formal market for uh, people who come there and shop so a, a street can also become a place for a few hours you know and give way to a meaningful uh, place spaces between buildings can turn into places like nehru place on top where all this build, these buildings give uh, rise to um, a very vibrant public place again famous for its computer market food stalls uh, exporters and again select city walk which has uh, this big place between all the places which is very popular with the young population in delhi and again uh, shoppers metro station as pause point and social interaction last a uh, few years since the metro came in all these uh, places you know especially the ones which have been renovated uh, like the chatrapur metro station we have uh, a very uh, a good example of place how uh, you know people not just waiting for their metro to come in or waiting for their uh, relative to pick them up becomes a place for interaction where you want to stop you want to hang out you want to catch up on the phone with your friends so that's an important place right now and uh, there's a fascinating bond between people places and memory this is the bangla sahib road and the hanuman mandir foreground where people stop uh, they want to get some mehndi done they want to uh, buy bangles and they want to go on a tuesday and uh, do their uh, religious uh, ceremony and come back so these uh, places in delhi are uh, you know full of these uh, lively examples where you can do different uh, activities uh, in in one place itself the rajpath is a seat of power if you look at uh, it from this scale and if you look at it from a human scale you know this place has a memory it has celebration it has the rajpath it has the republic day parade with so much of public coming in and for a person like me you know where where we've grown in delhi where we used to go to india gate for our uh, ice creams there were ice cream vendors once upon a time and uh, you know everybody from delhi has memories in and around uh, india gate for uh, Uh, going and uh, hanging out in this place even for picnics in these lawns so the social aspect of uh, places actually makes the place very vibrant and interactive if you see this uh, uh, these steps the amphitheater in ihc though it's a closed place but still you know this uh, becomes a place when so many people interact and they enjoy the space and they come together and make this into a vibrant uh, interesting place even a plinth area of a house uh, outside a house can become a, a place in itself where he, these children are uh, waiting and they're making uh, some notes and interacting with each other and a small space can become a place if the human scale is right uh i'll end my um, uh, slide show with this uh, picture from shah jahanabad the uh, old delhi where there is business there is shopping there is street food and all the culture of uh, the place and the people and the memories come together and play a very vital role in this part of the old uh, city and uh, gives give give it a meaning and a place in itself so shah jahanabad is a monument in itself it's a lively place and every nook and corner has uh, culture and people and memories linked to it i think i'll close my uh, presentation here and uh, let's have a discussion if, after all the presentations are done thank you uh many thanks lady for your presentation it was indeed a very very interesting uh, you know memory down uh, you know to the like taking a look at the places that have been part of your growing up years uh so i think uh, we will catch up with you uh, when we start with our discussions
Uh, I would now like to introduce the next speaker for the session, Michael Stott. Michael is an urban designer and strategic planner who has spent the last 20 plus years working on projects around the world with extended periods in Australia, Asia, Canada, Europe, and the Middle East. Michael's diverse professional experience includes working for several leading globally recognized consultancies and government entities at the forefront of changing how cities are designed and planned. In his practice, Michael focuses on creating compelling place-led design solutions and delivering projects that work to increase the quality of life of community residents, whether through strategic planning and policy development, individual site design or large-scale master plans, urban design for new transportation corridors, or the design of a community park or in intimate urban plaza. As an accomplished facilitator and speaker, Michael regularly presents and consults internationally on issues related to placemaking, urban renewal, and creating healthy cities. He has also contributed to numerous publications, summer schools, urban design masterclasses, and placemaking seminars. Um, I now invite Michael to present his play story. Okay, thank you for that great introduction. I, it's funny, I haven't been to Delhi for about 10 years and those photos even made me feel a bit nostalgic for my last vi uh, visit there. So let me share my screen here and see how we go. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. my good friend Vanita said that when I introduce my presentation, I should make sure I speak with a smile in my voice. So Stan Ki Kushi <laughs> is how I've named uh, the presentation that I'm going to give you for a very specific reason, because I think the joy of place is so important and the serendipitous encounters that we all have in public spaces in different places in the world are so, you know, so incredibly important. And, and important to remember too, is that it's not all about scale. In fact, places that bring us the most joy are often the smallest. And I think um, when I talk about place, I talk about places that have grit and grain, you know, where people have invested meaning, um, not necessarily capital, uh, other than human capital, of course, over time. And each place that I've been to and that I love and that brings me joy, you really see its own history and unique kind of cultural and social identity um, that has been defined by not only the way it's used, but by the people who use it. So I'm gonna take you on a little journey through place and a couple of my favorites. But first I just wanted to say, that this last year especially has been uh, an extraordinary time. And what's, um, what's good to remember is that extraordinary times call for extraordinary solutions. And one of the small silver linings that I like to keep in mind with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is that many of history's most innovative realizations have come from times of health and economic crisis, which we find ourselves in now. And also, of course, one of the other small silver linings is that the human resiliency we've seen all around the world here in Mumbai in this photo have been absolutely in incredible and really shown the human spirit. And when we actually took away places at the ground plane and closed off our streets, what we started to see in the early days of the pandemic was people coming to their first floor, second floor, third floor apartments and acting and, and, and coming out onto their balconies and making those their places. So places can really be anything. Um, and you, you have a, what a COVID uh, has really shown us is that the, the, the journey from space to place can really be something quite impactful and, and important. So I thought I would actually start by showing you a park by my house. And it's because I see it all the time. And so my story of this place is that you know it's normally a pretty busy park and it's got lots of great stuff there's a football club and there's some other bits there and um really great park and uh, barbecues that we take my kids to but during covid because people were only allowed to access space you know a couple of times um in, in different times and it was quite restricted one of the funniest things i kept seeing was people would park their cars along the back there and they'd start unloading all of this fitness equipment because the gyms were all closed uh, here in australia and and they just became these exercise centers and these new kind of things where people just letting it all leaving it all out there and, and exercising in public I, you know the thing is is like nobody had a frown on their face there was a load of joy in this you know and and you know, I really found that people were so, because they had been 
in lockdown that when they came into any public space at all, they just had this incredible sense of joy. And we were even quite lucky. This is the same park that because normally Brisbane has these huge, uh, Bris the Brisbane festival every year that they actually created these little things that came to all the local public parks made from caravans and had live bands play. And, you know, everybody that was sitting there, you know, you wave and you see a neighbor that you haven't seen for a while. There's somebody that you recognize from work or in the community. And it really was a rallying point for communities here where I live. And, and I thought it was really quite important um, as a kind of starting point, even for today, just to kind of ground it in the place that I know best, which is my own backyard. But then scaling up a little bit, Granary Square in London uh, is one place of the year in 2014. It is an incredible resource for London and actually not that well known or, or visited. And I know you're just kind of peering into the photo, but if you can see the multiple layers of activity, historic buildings, there's a university there, grocery stores, restaurants, so many uses. You can see the canal aligning the bottom with an amphitheater and really it's about creating more than one thing to do. It's about creating a multitude of experiences so that you stay and you actually enjoy your time. You don't feel like you've done your one thing and then have to move on to something else. You can really invest here. And what's great about this is you see the, the water fountains there. Anybody can come along and program those water, the, the water fountains from their mobile phone. It's such a unique use of innovation and it's really quite great to see people changing the colors of the lights that show and kids uh, I know when we were there my kids just stripped off all their clothes and were nudie through the fountains and you know the other really taken for granted thing is that all of the all of the spaces here are lined with restaurants and because you have this great overlook you can watch your kids play in the fountain while you have a drink or have a meal which I think is really important and so on a hot day you see the kids there um, playing, but you also see they've rolled out some temporary stuff as well, including these hammocks that fold away at night, which I think make it really, really cool. And you just see all sorts of different kind of people in the space. And it also becomes home to, I think it's more than 200 festivals per year. And so the space is really heavily, heavily curated in terms of the amount of programming that goes on there um, and activities. And also it, it provides a venue for communities to come together for multicultural events, spontaneous dance events, really things that again, make you want to stop and sp spend time in the space. There's a busking festival a few times a year and lots of entertainment. And actually one of the great things is the water fountains are used multiple different ways at different times in the year, including by adults at night when they have these parties in the, in the fountains, which are then programmed by the lights. And so really it's this kind of day and nighttime and seasonal approach to place that really makes this place something special for me. But perhaps the thing I love the most is that every day on the canal, this bookshop pulls up on a barge and anybody can come on here and use the, get the books out, sit in the amphitheater and read the books. It is, it is absolutely lovely. And really you just see people sitting around with a smile on their face, enjoying the space and enjoying each other. I wanted to, to kind of talk on Bryant Park. It's often held up as kind of one of the preeminent places in the world, but we also have to remember that in the early 80s, it was drugs, prostitution, all sorts were happening there. And so it, it made a journey from this to the Bryant Park we know today. And what makes Bryant Park so special is that it's not only a place for local people, but people come here to really feel what it's like to be a New Yorker. And you really feel ingrained and embedded into the city. And I love always telling the story um, of the Bryant Park benches, the green uh, sort of bistro tables that you see here is that they, when, they, when Fred Kent for, from Project for Public Spaces first suggested that they put these seats everywhere where they're like, oh, you have to lock them down and you know, people will steal them. And, but people became so invested in this as a place that they actually only lose the bistro tables and chairs to maintenance every year and people, you know, maybe like one or two get stolen but it's actually not it's not a thing at all and you can again layers and layers and layers of activity going on here important like with the granary square example is it's anchored by a, a library called big cultural institution um, which i think really helps with the triangulation of uses and again adding um the different things to do um it also has a program of free fitness events all around the year from yoga and meditation to dancing, 
but I think importantly, it also has free juggling classes. I mean, what kind of park do you go to on your lunch hour and take a free juggling class? It's, you know, really a curated, again, you hear me use that word curated. It's, 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 it's happening because so much thought and time has been put into the activities that happen here. And these classes are all free, which is even, even more amazing in a city like New York. Of course, they have your traditional things too, like the pianos that we put in public spaces now. But everybody, you know, I was talking to my wife earlier and she's like, oh, don't show the picture of the piano. You know, people always say, it's been, and I said, yes, but whenever there's a piano, somebody comes and plays it. So it works. And, you know, it creates this opportunity for people to really have this concert in public space and enjoy music. And, and it's just, it's just free. It just, it just happens spontaneously. They also importantly, again, here too, have this nighttime economy, which, uh, or a nighttime events program, which happens, which makes sure that the, it's not just a daytime space and it's really a nighttime space too. And it's also a winter space. And they have these great winter markets that are so incredible in, in Bryant Park in New York and super popular. And again, animated all, you know, all year round, regardless of the season, there's something to do in this place. And, you know, not only does it have a skating rink on the lawn in the winter, it also has bumper boats. And so the reason I love this photo is because when you see it, it's unexpected. And when you're there in person, you walk along and see something like this. And it's the delight and the joy of seeing something like bumper car or bumper boats on a skating rink in winter in New York that makes everybody smile a little bit more. Of course, too, they have a Santa uh, which comes out and that's just to say that there's seasonal and festival, uh, festivalized events, um, again, all free. So this brings me to one of my favorite places which is Bandra in, in, in uh, Mumbai. And it's like the canvas of all these other places I'm showing you, but disaggregated across a much larger space. And I, I, I take a lot of joy um, in, in wandering around the this, this streets of Bandra when I was there last with my, with my wife a, a few years ago, because there's just so much found delight and joy in the little things that happen and the little spaces that are created in the, you know, in, in the village, Bandra village, where they've done, you know, they've, they, they had the, the international thing where 20 artists came and painted all the buildings and it's just absolutely incredible because it, it creates this vibrancy, but again, on this huge canvas. Um, and, you know, I just think it's so funny because now the art, when people are just walking by, they live in the area, they just kind of, you know, yeah, we've got some really great international art here, you know, they, and, and they almost take it for granted how great the space is. And so when we were there last, we're like, oh my God, this is so special. And people are like, yeah, it's pretty special, you know. It's, it was really funny. Um, and what I love about this one here is not only is it, a, you know, this funny picture of the cat and then, and uh, this beautiful little incidental public space that's been created, but there's also a cat enjoying the space, which makes it even more special uh, on, the, on the right of the picture. When we were there too, of course, we were very lucky to time it with uh, the Ganesha Festival. And uh, I just, honestly, the streets were alive and the drumming was incredible. And it just made for such an animated space um, and really made me feel a part of something. I think what was important is it made us feel a part of something bigger than us, but it also didn't make us feel like we were excluded from it. It actually made us feel very much involved in it. And we went with the procession and, and followed it down before we had lunch. The um, Carter Road Promenade, this, um, this pop-up here, which was done by the Bangor Collective, um, you know, again, you just see these kind of these old dudes probably come here every day, chit chatting about nothing, complaining about life. And you see these younger generation in the corner and you see all these people, you know, enjoying this kind of space and, and not, it's not even programmed. It's just, they've provided a place for people to sit, gather, be a community, share their stories, share their memories. It's, it's actually, it's a really lovely thing. And then the only thing of course, is that we need many, many more of them. Um, not just in Bandra, of course, but all, all around, uh, all around the world, if not, you know, if not further. And so one, I also wanted to show that tactical urbanism, of course, is alive and, and well, and this year, even more so in, um, you see what they've done with uh, the early works of HP Junction here. 
it just really shows you how much wasted space. You know, in Canada, where I'm from originally, what we do every year is it snows and it's like finding space because the snow hits the street and you realize that the cars are only using 15% of the street and the rest is just snow. And you're like, so how is it all winter? They can use this limited space and yet the rest of the year, it's just nothing. So really found space is really important because one of my key things I always tell people is any space can become a place. It just takes a little bit of love and initiative. Of course, you see here too, how much people immediately started to use the space and then really use the space so much so that the open streets program, I think will actually stick around now as a, as a, as a regular thing. And it's, it's actually quite nice to kind of rehumanize the streets by taking them over as an act of rebellion and feeling like you really belong and this is our place. Um, two, you know, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't not mention the, the Banstead Promenade either, which I love because it just, you know, one of what's, you know, it's it, the, the, the conservation of you know, what they've done to fix it has been incredible. And I think it had uh, one of the first um, Pelican, um, uh, pedestrian priority crossings in, in in Mumbai put in, which everybody said, you can't do that. People will get killed. And of course they put it in and people just crossed and, you know, the kind of rules of the road kind of followed suit. But what I love about this, just the linear view is just all the little intimate spaces that are created along here and, and how important they become to everybody that not only lives in the area, but specifically visit the area to come here and enjoy and feel a part of the space. And Mumbai, of course, also has a Christmas festival, just like Bryant Park, and is actually, again, really great at creating these kind of festivalized spaces. But importantly, also things to do at nighttime. Again, you have to have spaces that are used day and night in different ways and, a, and year round and appropriate to climatic conditions, whether it's the monsoon like I've got going outside my house here or the one you guys get there or winter like we get in the Northern Hemisphere. But the reality is the best part is the food. And I can honestly say it has some other than Delhi, of course, some of my favorite street food in the world. So what does all this mean? This is the great thing. It's actually not that hard. You can start with very little. But I would say that some of my lessons learned over the past kind of 20 odd years is that Great places work hand in hand with arts and culture. This is about triangulating uses. Oh. Animating public spaces requires thinking, planning, and collaboration. If you do it for somebody instead of with them, it'll never be used as much as if you do it with them. And like I said earlier, wherever there's a space, there's potential for place. And design is only a small but significant part of placemaking. And I say that because some of the best places in the world, like this one I'm showing here, this picture from Chennai, it's just chalk on the road. Like it, it hasn't cost them a lot. And so the design is incidental, but the use created is, is amazing. And really you need to curate the experience. I, I like using two of the examples of kind of Granary Square, Bryant Park and Chicago's Millennium Square because Chicago's Millennium Square in particular, because it has over 3000 free events a year. It's, it's, it's an incredible investment. And so day, nights and, and seasonally, having more than one thing to do is critical. And then for these bigger spaces, of course, what I would reinforce is that place governance and management really matter. And small, simple ideas can have a massive impact. And then to always remember that people attract people. I just do a plug too. I'd love to come and meet you all in person um, when we hold our placemaking week in India um, next December. Uh, I hope to see many of you there and please do reach out to Vanita on uh, info at the smart citizen .org, um, to come and get involved and maybe come and share your place stories with us and help us understand more about what placemaking in the in the Indian context means to you because it's the personal stories I think that mean so much. So. By all means, please do check out the website. There's loads of great webinars pre-recorded on there. And just remember that, like I said, when I started is it's really place is about bringing joy and what better place to do it than in India, one of my favorite places in the world, um, with the flower market here in Bangalore, 
come and play with us on Place Making India and follow me on social media if you like. Come and say hello. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, for this very interesting presentation right from New York to our very own Mumbai. I think it was uh, very, very interesting to see how you know people have engaged and how experiences in spaces have cre been created and they are now uh, you know very meaningful places. Uh, without losing any more time, I would just now like to introduce the next speaker for the session, Mr. Adwaid Jani. Adwaid is a senior manager of sustainable cities and transport at WRI India. At present, he is working on several road safety projects such as the Haryana Vision Zero program and Botnar Child Road Safety Challenge. He is also involved with a street design project in various Indian cities. Prior to joining WRI, he has worked with the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy in Chennai on various street design projects, cycle sharing, parking management, and multimodal integration. He has also been involved with the Sabarmati Riverfront project and Kankaria Lakefront development in Ahmedabad while working for the XCP design planning and management. In addition, he has also been involved with several technical publications like Better Cities, uh, Bet sorry, Better Streets, Better Cities, Footpath Basics, and Footpath Six. He holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from Anna University and a master's degree in urbanism from Delft University of Technology and Universita UAV de Venezia. I now adv uh, invite Adwet to present his story. Thanks, Roshi. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, we can. I'm just going to switch off my video uh, if I don't trust my internet. I hope that's fine. Sure. sure. All right. So, I basically would, as Urvashi mentioned, I basically work on a lot of street design and road safety related projects. And I thought it's only apt that I talk about it and how we generally go about this work. Uh, and mainly in terms of how we use tactical urbanism as a tool uh, to push for sustainable change in our city. So I'm, I'm not going to talk about any particular city or any particular place but a generic uh, intervention on how we can go about making streets as places uh, and you know how anyone whoever is listening out there you can do it as an individual you can do it as a community or you can even do it in collaboration with the government uh, so from how to do something from small to something big uh, and basically that's why i wanted to talk mainly about streets so uh, what are streets? I think everybody knows that everyone has experienced being in a street. I think every, it's all they're also known as the urban arteries. Without streets, cities would come to a standstill. You know, people won't be able to move. Goods won't be able to move. Uh, there would be complete chaos in terms of its financial structure of a city. And they are looked mainly as a place uh, for moving, uh, for movement rather. Uh, but Traditionally in India, there have also been a place for gathering, uh, especially streets, you know, which are much smaller. They are a place where uh, neighbors meet each other. There is community engagement that happens and a lot of other activities also that do take place uh, on these streets. Most importantly for me, streets have always been a place uh, of equity. I think as I as mentioned, because it's, it's a place where everyone comes and everyone is treated equally and in a way it is a sign of democracy also a lot of global cities look at uh, streets as a space of uh, being equal uh, unfortunately india the story is not as beautiful as it sounds uh, in india most of us or most cities look at their streets purely with the purpose of moving cars uh, they just think that if you know if we build a street then it's mainly for uh, moving vehicles and most importantly private vehicles and the other users tend to always get neglected. I think every one of us who's been in India has experienced this for sure. Uh, so one of the myths I wanted to sort of burst today was that you know there is a difference between roads and streets. Most of us think they're pretty much the same. Maybe a road is slightly wider and a street is slightly narrower. But there are certain technical differences also, which I thought it's important to highlight uh, and people should know about this. Uh, so it's just a short video uh, I'll explain. So one of the first differences I wanna talk about is the alignment, uh, a, what the alignment between a road and a street. So 
a road generally is a, a design from the center line towards out whereas a street generally is designed from the out towards in because of the kind of uses uh, that are there in each of this infrastructure. Roads are generally meant for high speed point to point traffic, whereas streets are meant for slow traffic uh, because again, there are multiple users and also there are multiple cross connections that happen at a street. Uh, the third point is the difference in the edges, the edge condition, uh, roads generally are open. So when you drive, you know, from probably Delhi to Jaipur, you realize it's completely open. There are fields or forests on the side, uh, but streets generally have closed edges. So you will always find an active edge. Uh, there's either building, there's a lot of trees, a lot of plants that are happening there, but the edges are always closed and they, tend, they always tend to be active with some sort of uh, either people walking or, you know, other activities that happen. And the final difference is the principle. And this one is the most important. Roads are generally designed keeping in mind only vehicles, irrespective of its size. The idea is that any vehicle can fit in the road and just go at, at its desired speed. Whereas streets are done for multiple users. It's not just for vehicles. And therefore it's important for us to see who these users are. They're basically pedestrians, cyclists, uh, and public transport. Uh, what I want to highlight here is that these three categories or rather these three mode share account for almost 60 to 80 percent of your movement in cities. Uh, unlike popular belief that you know all our cities uh, most of them travel by cars, that's not the reality. Private vehicles actually only account for 20 percent of the mode share. And within private vehicles, it's actually 80% are actually two wheelers and only 20% or so less are using cars in India. But there are also other users of our streets. There's a lot of vending that happens here. You know, uh, we end up buying most of our groceries, street food, everything is what comes out is sold in the street. But also it is a place for gathering. Uh, Traditionally also, and even now, a lot of people do use street uh, as a space for interacting uh, with each other. And the final use, of course, is parking. Uh, cities like Delhi, Mumbai, uh, Chennai, everyone knows there's pretty much parking everywhere that happens. Uh, and, but this is one of the uses of uh, parking, of, of the street rather. So uh, what I wanted to highlight was basically how do we bring about the change? So the difference again here is on the left side, what you see here is the road, you know, as I mentioned, you can clearly see a wide space. It's pretty much empty on either side, but on the right is actually a street. Most of us think this is a road, but no, these are streets too. Just because they're wide does not matter. Uh, the, the reality is that, you know, there are multiple uses that are happening. Uh, it goes through the city and therefore it automatically is categorized as a street. Uh, other examples of streets across India. And you can clearly see how our cities look at this particular space. They, we, our engineers, our officials think of these spaces only for vehicles. And while there are multiple activities happening all over, uh, you can only see is tar or you know asphalt all over just for vehicles to move. And this is an extremely unfortunate uh, situation for us in India because it clearly shows where the priorities of the city is. You know, it, it clearly shows the priority is only for only if you own a car, then we will make this for you. Or if you're a pedestrian or a cyclist, you know, you have to pretty much fend for yourself. And what this basically does is it red brings down the quality of the space completely, you know. Uh, it makes it very unsafe, but it also makes it very undesirable to go to such spaces. Uh, so what we have been doing is basically trying to push for on how do we reclaim what is ours and start putting out the fact that uh, streets are also places and they need to be treated in a different way. Uh, some of the measures are one of the first measures and simplest measure is con converting parking into parklets. Uh, it's basically, it's a, it's a very simple low cost intervention uh, where you identify generally a spot where parking happens and remove the parking and use that space for anything else except parking. Uh, it's picked up a lot this time of the year because of COVID uh, 
and the requirement for physical distancing. Uh, parklets have become a lot more popular now across the world. They are extremely low cost. Uh, a lot of restaurants, a lot of cities have been giving permission to restaurants to you know, open their own parklets by removing parking space in front of their restaurant. Uh, in India, it's still not picked up, unfortunately. Yes, the, the photograph that you see on the right uh, is by City Sabha uh, of an intervention, a parklet intervention that was done in CR Park. a few months ago, uh, based at their residence, at their office, and at their recreation. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, cities also, city officials think that, yes, car owners are entitled to free parking space. So, you know, how can we remove parking? And this is the thing that we need to start changing. There is a lot of potential just by removing, you can clearly see just by removing two car spaces, the space has already become a lot more vibrant. The second intervention, which is slightly large scale, is of course uh, no car zones or popularly known as car free days, car free Sundays. India has its very own Ragiri day here, which is quite popular across almost 70 to 70 to 80 odd cities. Uh, but this is a very, this is again a very small short term program because you generally do it over a Sunday. Uh, a simple road stretch is picked up based on certain studies. And the idea is very simple. On a given Sunday every month, the road is the street is shut and it's open for public. Basically, it's shut for cars and open for people. And you're pretty much free to do whatever you want. Uh, this is an example from Gurgaon where they, there was a comparison being done between how much space a car takes versus cycling versus a bus uh, to carry 50 uh, people at any given time. So it, it's also a good. Uh, space to you know educate people on on various things. There have been uh, themes in Chennai, from what I remember, where uh, a lot of talk was happening about how to prevent malaria and stuff. And these became amazing spaces to you know interact, uh, to have an interaction between officials and the citizens. Uh, so it, this this is something that is very popular. The only thing we need to do in India is now to have this more on a regular basis and also find ways to multiply this uh, across uh, cities. Uh, another example, this is one of the initial ones. This is in New York, uh, Broadway, Times Square, how it used to be and how they converted it uh, on one given weekend. And it's become so popular that now, of course, everyone knows Times Square. It is a permanent uh, fixture now and that cars will never be allowed into the space ever again because people have just fallen in love with what uh, the new intervention looked like. So this this is something, again, this is something that can be done at a community level. And I think the, especially if you are in neighborhoods, you know, where you have a good relationship between your policymaker, your bureaucrat, it is something I, I would suggest people to go try this out in your own neighborhood. Uh, just shut down the street for one Sunday and see how what a difference it can make uh, and how much value it adds to your uh, life. The third thing that we go about is in because as as I said, I work a lot on road safety. Uh, so we do a lot of tactical urbanism interventions at intersections, especially because intersections are places where multiple modes sort of are in conflict. Uh, and this is the point where the conflict is always at its highest. So we have been doing these tactical urbanism uh, interventions. This is just a short video of uh, what we had done in Rotak, it, it took us probably, I think, six to eight hours in the night. And in the morning, the space was pretty much transformed into what you can see right now. Uh, you can clearly see the paint shows how much space has been reclaimed, uh, space that was never ever used. Uh, and as, as a previous speaker mentioned about the snow in Canada, in India, it's the dust so we look at how much dust is settled on the ground uh, to show you know, how much space is actually being used by vehicles and how much is not being used. And you can clearly see here how much space we were able to reclaim. Uh, and this, the space that has been reclaimed can now be made into a meaningful place after designing and after construction. But 
as a point of an idea, uh, as a seed that we have planted into the officials, this was a great starting point because now the main the main fear that the officials, the traffic police and city had that, you know, oh my God, what about the traffic jam that it may cause uh, is gone because we were able to show it to them that it does not matter if you take up these uh, excessive space that has been, you know, constructed earlier. Uh, another example from Mumbai that WR had worked on was the Nagpada Junction, uh, which was, I think, the same time as the HP Junction. Uh, as you can clearly see, once again, a lot of parking everywhere that happened. Uh, tactical urbanism intervention was done uh, at the place. And once the bureaucrats and the councillors saw it, that it was working fine, they were more than happy to uh, construct it. And I think it just shows how such simple interventions, you know, a cones that cost probably 500 rupees a cone, uh, you know, we buy a hundred of them and they can make such a big uh, difference. So just to finish the last bit is basically the, the more expensive bit. I, these are my last two slides uh, on how other cities have gone about creating spaces or creating places within the streets. This is a photo from Seoul, uh, an elevated corridor, which was demolished a few years ago and now has been created into this beautiful public space, uh, which they are very proud of. Another one being the Boston one, where again, an expressway going right through the city was demolished to create these new public spaces for people and not for cars. So I've come to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you so much for listening in. And if you do have any questions or do need any help in trying out any of these tactical urbanism please do email me. Thank you. Thank you, Adwet, for that very enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, now I would uh, request uh, Adhubya and Somya to please uh, take up any questions that have come up for the speakers. Hi, sir. Uh, so this question is to Michael. Uh, the landmark public spaces find many uses in dense urban areas. Challenge is to do so for small public spaces, especially parks, even in dense residential neighborhoods in India. What has your experience been with seeding such spaces in US and Canada? Uh, interestingly, it's Again, it's this idea of found space, and maybe not in the US and Canada. I'll give you an example from Amman in Jordan, where we were doing some place making um, in the uh, refugee camps, and they were so dense and so crowded, and there was no space. I mean, but we went and we bought, uh, I think it was two benches and a, and a potted plant and things. And this is, and this is I think, in 2000 seven or eight and created and you know, found a space and created it. And so we created, you know, a, a little, a little corner and, and, and made it into something. And I think sometimes people put things too quickly in the, this is too hard basket. I think that's also a kind of a side, a uh, side effect of uh, over-regulation and, and, and different things um, here in Australia and in Canada, we find that to do a parklet, for example, is so incredibly overregulated that most people just won't do it. So, you know, it's, it's too hard. And so they, 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 the ideas are lost. And so what we have seen in the last year through COVID is the rapid deregularization de of, of public space so that people were able to do things without having to go through the same channels that they would. And so people were actually finding space and actually doing something about it. And so I think um, in, in India, uh, in, in, in a different context, but in the same thing is that I can walk uh, street after street after street and there's nowhere to sit. I can walk and, you know, street after street after street and there's, you know, maybe there's not much urban landscape and things like this. And so I, th I think there's like loads of opportunity, but what you need to do is look for the cheap and easy. You know, the, the PPS would tell you to do the lighter, quicker, cheaper stuff. And it's true because little things have a big impact. And if you did 10 little things in your immediate neighborhood where you live, that'll have a huge impact because if you're then neighbors on the other side do 10 little things, 
all of a sudden, you, you know, it's creating, it's why I didn't focus on one specific place in Bangra because there's so many amazing spaces. What hasn't been done in Bangra, for example, is it hasn't been all brought together into kind of some kind of consistent sequencing of, of place. So I don't know, I mean, I, I'm just more, uh, you know, I, I really, I think the North American experience, the Australian experience, it, it's all quite similar. And, and I think the scale of bureaucracy is often different, but otherwise it's, it's very similar and found space is the way to go, even if, actually, so here's a funny thing. So I had, um, I had this conversation with somebody the other day because in a lot of Indian cities, it was quite, uh, uh, we, were, we actually we were talking on a call before this and it was, but the idea that people would sit in front of their house um, you know, on their chairs because they didn't have air conditioning. So that became a place. So the, the two chairs on the road in front of your house become a place. And then actually the same thing happens all over Europe. You know, you get the old Italian ladies or the old Greek ladies sitting in front of their houses, taking back the street and creating a place. So, you know, these, these things are, are easy, but you have to start somewhere. And so you might as well start with your own neighborhood or your own house or your own shop. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I would like to ask a question. question. I would like to ask a question. Oh, yeah, uh, so please go uh, To Michael Sir itself. Uh, so uh, I, first of all, I found that programmable fountain really interesting. It's something that uh, that really caught my attention. Okay, and uh, when I was just looking at the Bryant Park design, so you were talking about leaving the benches and the tables on the in the park. So my question is, so, so what? Okay. So what about the homeless? How do you deal with the homeless people of the city? So are public spaces only for the, uh, the, the, the privileged citizens? Or so what do you do about the homeless citizens? So one thing I personally notice in a lot of public spaces, even in bus stands, uh, in, especially in, uh, so I, from my personal experience from in India, they make, so the initially they used to have benches. So now they make rods so that these homeless yeah, people don't sleep on it. Yeah, so they don't sleep on it. So mm. I mean, I find that a very privileged decision to do make. Why it can't? Why cannot they sleep on it at night? Because anyway, like where it's rarely being used. So well, how do you deal with that? And so when you just keep these benches and uh, you know chairs at night, so, uh, do the homeless people use it? Are they allowed to? You know. I, even uh, outside in other countries, I have seen even just on window sills, I've seen they have kept spikes so that they don't sleep there and yeah. things like that. So how do you deal? How do they deal with that? Well, it's interesting. Eh? We spend all of this money creating public spaces and then put the means in place to stop people from using them. <laughs> and so actually, Bryant Park is such a great example because it has the nicest public bathrooms in New York City. <laughs> Because there's a flower market next to it, the lady from the flower market takes her flowers at the end of the day, the ones that she couldn't sell or are going, you know, wilting, and she puts them on this table in front of the public bathroom so that when you come in, you go left to go to the women's or right to the men's, there's this beautiful bouquet of public, of free, you know, just flowers to, to look at. And I just, you know, when we say like what, so if we take the, if we park the Indian context aside from it, because homelessness and, and, and street dwelling is, is, a, is, a, is a bit of a different thing, and you look at the rest of the world for a moment, I think part of the problem is that there's been the, the systemic problem of homelessness and loss of inclusion in our cities and public spaces is actually something that we could start to address, address through inclusion in public spaces. And so... You know, like I, I get that. Um, so in New York, for example, you're allowed to sleep on public benches, but you're not allowed, but there's somebody will come by and um, it used to be that they'd come by the, the, the cop with the stick and knock you on your feet and say, you know, the rest of the city's starting, go, go somewhere else. And, but again, you're just marginalizing people into a different space. So it, it's such a deeply ingrained societal problem. It, it'd be like saying, you know, to pavement dwellers in 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 in, uh, in Bangalore, you know, oh, we want to make this a pretty beautiful public space. It's going to be so great, but you're not welcome. <laughs> it's like, well, 
it doesn't really address one the problem of homelessness ever in ever it doesn't address inclusion in public space and public space making because maybe we should be asking these people who are in this position what could we do to bring you joy in your life every day that would make your life just that little bit better that maybe you would be inspired to do something different or what kind of social assistance can we give them through creating inclusive public spaces um and, and the, the mechanisms that you're saying too is what you'll find is the, the, the bench phenomenon is something that's blown, blown my mind all around the world, but most of the spaces that are created that have those kind of inclusions are actually semi-private spaces. So the forecourt of a building or through a contribution as a part of the planning process, they have to build a public space, but then the deal is that they, they semi-regulate it. So it's not really a, a public space. Um, and, you, you know, it's just, there, there has to be, I think a deeper question asked about what are we doing to resolve uh, homelessness in a way that makes sense for, that makes sense for us rather than just keep pushing them away to the margins. Um, I don't know if you, I mean, if you guys are aware, but Vancouver, Portland and Los Angeles and San Francisco have some of the largest homelessness populations in the, in the kind of uh, Northern hemisphere. And, um, you know, so you see these beautiful postcard cities, but then you also see these pavement dwellers absolutely everywhere. And, you know, excluding them from public space, again, it's just not the answer. So I think we need to look more deeply at kind of how to include them in the design of public space or in the design of infrastructure, which, you know, like more public toilets, different things. I don't know. It's such a hard question. I wish I, I wish I had a proper answer for you other than I just really feel I have a strong concern that we're not, we're not yet addressing homelessness and, and social inclusion as a kind of means to go forward. And maybe that's, you're a lot younger than me, so maybe that's your next challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a very interesting question that Atulia has raised. Uh, I think this is a point that should be considered while we are talking about you know, public spaces, especially as places. I think uh, we, it has to be inclusive and we have to include people from all sections of society. And the important thing is that not just include them, but they need to be made to feel that they are wanted in that space. Is, is what is very important. Uh, I think there is one question for uh, Adwet. Uh, uh, Atulia, can you just read it out? Yeah. So the question to Adwet Jain is, uh, appreciated the initiatives you described, the Ministry of Heavy Industries through its automotive mission is putting out cars on the road faster than the house, Ministry of Housing and Urban <laughs> Administration through the Smart Cities mission can remove them. <laughs> From your vantage point, who is going to win? <laughs> well, uh, okay, I'm going to give a very politically correct answer. Uh, no one's going to win if we're going to keep letting cars into our streets. It's as simple as that. I think I think every city across the world has learned this the hard way. We talk about American cities. We talk about Dutch cities. You know, we talk about cities in East Asia. Uh, everyone that has been building this. Uh, infrastructure for cars since the post-World War II era have all failed in it. And what is important is, and the unfortunate thing is that we have not learned from their mistakes at all. Uh, instead, we continue to create the same mistakes most of these other cities have been doing, you know, in the 1940s and 1950s, 60s. So, the thing is, we are all going to be losers. You know, we'll end up having more cars, but we're also going to end up having more congestion. We're going to end up having more pollution. We're going to end up having more people killed on the roads. And one of the very unique thing is in, uh, I'm not from Delhi, I just moved two years ago, uh, is the level of uh, road rage that I see in Delhi uh, is very, very high. Uh, it just shows how much uh, the society has sort of degraded here. Uh, you know, people killing each other, people beating each other over parking space. Uh, and it, it just shows, you know, that we're not going to win uh, if, if we uh, continue to let cars, you know, uh, run on our streets. I would say, I would add to what you're saying there and say again, 
I'm really looking for silver linings around the world right now of what COVID has brought us in. London, Paris, Mexico City, Bogota, uh, Berlin, Vancouver, Montreal, cities around the world are now creating car-free cycle and, and pedestrian networks. Here, before this, unheard of, right? And so the one thing that has come out of it when you started to take the cars off the street a little bit and, 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 and you started to look at public space differently is we are now seeing a level of investment in public infrastructure, which might bring us closer to where we should be as business as usual, and then maybe inspire us to go beyond that, right? So we often look at in public infrastructure like greenways and bicycle ways as, uh, you know, if I look at the city of Sydney, for example, they've just invested $4 billion in creating new pedestrian spaces, but that $4 billion worth of investment probably takes them to a level of a city, which is where the city should be anyway. So what we need to do, and some of the stuff that you guys are doing at WRI is get it, we need to get it from here to here. We've, we've come up here, now we gotta fill this gap next. And I think that's gonna be all of our challenge in the next kind of decade uh, as we move to 2021 is how do we fill the infrastructure gap um, with pedestrian and, and cycle infrastructure? I think that's quite right what you are saying, Michael. Um, you know, it is unfortunate that from uh, world over, if we see all our cities, they had been traditionally walking cities only. People could easily walk to your school, the office, and the market. These were very, very accessible. Uh, but now uh, it's a completely reversed thing. I think uh, the focus we have to move the focus from uh, designing automobile friendly cities to people friendly cities. That the entire focus and trust has to be on how we can make our cities and especially the neighborhoods at least walkable. You know, I, 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 I know that we cannot wish away cars. We all, you know, we all need to use vehicles because the cities themselves have grown so big that we need these kind of, uh, you know, this kind of connectivity and mobility has to be there. But somewhere we have to, I think, uh, strike a balance between, uh, you know, uh, there are so many benefits, you know, uh, we've, uh, we all know about the benefits of walking, you know. In fact, uh, the fact that children uh, learn so many things by being independent, you know, uh, nowadays we have, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, we are bringing up our children in a very, very controlled environment, controlled interaction with people. They will drop to the school, pick up, picked up from the school. So I think it is very important that you know we try to make these kind of changes so that the next generation, which is uh, you know coming up, is actually you know more uh, looking at places, uh, you know, at public spaces at, as places because we are trying to you know uh, get ideas from different places and try to do some kind of experimental place making right now. I would say, uh, but to reach to a level as you mentioned that uh, you know it becomes spontaneous that people start, you know, their own small little initiatives and, uh, you know, creating these small, I would say, uh, you know, pauses of spaces inside, you know, wherever possible in their neighborhood is very, very in, uh, important. And I think, I know maybe we need to, you know, uh, actually systematize this and also create opportunities and encourage, uh, we begin with RWAs and these kind of community groups, which can be actually, you know, uh, tutored and also encouraged and facilitated in terms of the know-how to uh, take up these small initiatives because you know events like Ragiri have become very popular now. Uh, but these are you know uh, like uh, once in a Sunday kind of initiative. But I think if we can also encourage you know people to create their own small little initiatives which actually lead up to a larger Ragiri day maybe. I think that is something which uh, probably needs to be facilitated. Um, I would like to ask one uh, you know rather ask maybe to comment on one uh, aspect of public spaces as places. Uh, maybe we always see that public spaces, uh, basically how they convert into places is through our interaction with them. And art, it is you know, through mundane activities, through our daily uh, routines of life, we create places, you know. Uh, for me, my uh, milk shop would be a place for interaction with my friends, or, you know, the neighborhood park would become a place. So you know, would you like to comment on this uh, and how these kind of, you know, uh, interactions and associations can be you know, reinforced through uh, certain, um, you know, interventions that can be made in public spaces.
I think uh, all all the places that uh, we see around us have uh, these kind of uh, spaces which can be converted into places. But uh, we need to again, you know, like um, uh, Michael said, you know, we need need to explore these spaces. A lot of time, you know, we have these spaces which are lying obsolete, redundant, and are are uh, you know lost spaces. But uh, this can be done as a part of the RWAs, the communities which can come together. You know, a small um, parking lot or some. Uh, plot which is lying vacant and is converted into a dump yard these places can become places where you know which can be a tot lot where young moms can uh, meet up and you know it becomes a place for them or uh, if there's a lack of uh, 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 sports activity for students uh, for students or uh, resident you know that can uh, become a place where the elderly can uh, watch over the kids and you know these kind of pla places can uh, there is uh, no dearth of these spaces it's just for the community to come together and uh, you know work on these spaces and then become a place every community has these spaces and uh, you know we have been uh, even iudi has been working closely with the uh, the model of public participation to come up with uh, you know different areas we worked in lajpat nagar we are right now working in karol bagh so people have ideas there is no dearth of ideas and places both so it's just that the community has to come together and explore uh, explore it and uh, again get funding and uh, get the places uh, right for them so there is no uh, stopping i think there's no stopping of people and uh, uh, ideas and uh, these initiatives can take up and uh, if uh, you know any anybody who's watching uh, the live streaming is uh, interested in, uh, in delhi we are uh, very actively uh, helping communities out with these initiatives and uh, ready to explore you know when uh, if they need our help or uh, are ready to come up with areas they need ideas or they need uh, some funding or need to collaborate and come together we are always open for that yeah so i think that would be great maybe if you could just uh, you know uh, leave your email id in the chat box to so that whoever wants to yeah I'll just do that yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um so uh, my next you know question is about is to advait you know um, advait uh, you've been talking about how you know you've been transforming uh, the i would say roads into streets which are more people friendly so uh, could you talk about some specific examples in which you know uh, how we can connect communities how you know through streets uh, usually streets are seen as you know mode of transportation as commutation how can streets be made into places as a as a daily experience not just as an event or a curated experience but how you know have you been working on some kind of initiative where we can uh, on a daily basis uh, you know an initiative which tries to you know convert people to um, be able to connect with streets in a more you know personal manner yeah so we actually the work that i've been doing we don't do it on a daily basis that sort of uh, you know because i feel that something that has to be taken up at a community level only then there are higher chances of it being successful uh, it has to be community driven because people over there know what's best for them and they know what how best to even adopt to a certain situation if it is not working right or wrong we generally facilitate uh, in the technical bit uh, of things and one of the ways we go about doing this is first you know is to acknowledge all the stakeholders that are there you know as as i've been mentioning generally cities think if it's a street then it's only cars or bikes that's the main stakeholder the rest are you know whatever the remaining leftovers but the reality is as i said you know pedestrians cyclists uh, vendors they account for the majority of your stakeholders which are completely ignored so the first things we need to always do is acknowledge who are there you know who are the people uh, to whom this space or this place belongs to uh, because then they would be the right people to make a judgment on how what is good or what is sort of bad Uh, intervention you know in that particular stretch of street or road it may be so uh, acknowledging i feel is the first step always that you know we need to take care of that and then there has to be of course a systematic engagement with them so that uh, they don't feel left out from the discussion uh, as michael said you know they they have to feel like they the, the thing belongs to them you know the intervention belongs to them the, it's is for the people that it's been done for and when once that happens once that belief is there in the people then they would be the ones who would nurture it take care of it and let it grow even more 
So we need to make sure that engagement also stays. Uh, there should be a constant engagement. Okay. So has the WRI taken any kind of you know initiative? Any you know uh, initiative in which people can actually you know come to you or you know uh, get some technical know-how? Uh, because many times you know people don't even realize that uh, what are their rights when it comes to public places how much you know you can do there how what is which is not allowed you know what is not allowed is everybody knows you know people <laughs> there's so much yeah. of encroachment and other things which are happening there but if yeah. somebody somebody wants to do make a you know bring out a positive change in that space uh, yeah. do you have any so, uh, i think so we are, uh, yes i would say it's yes and no because uh, wri generally works a lot closer with government agencies. Uh, and that's why sort of our partner, which is Ragiri Foundation, uh, they come in the picture and help us with these sort of stakeholder engagement because it's one of their core values that they work on. WRI in a way is slightly more technical uh, from you know the, the way we look at things at uh, in terms of measurements, in terms of numbers, and then how do we create a, a nice space for that. So, but Ragiri is the one that, uh, Ragiri Foundation is the one that helps us, you know, uh, with the community engagement bit of things. Sure. So, uh, my question to Michael is, uh, Michael, we see public spaces as places and they are full of history, you know, memory experiences, identity. Uh, they are all about communities and the sense of belongingness. Uh, how would you suggest, you know, what could be the tools to basically, you know, uh, include people in the planning process you know what are the little things that can be done to you know reach out to people and in terms you know in turn you know encourage them to be able to you know uh, reach out to the people who are actually designing and planning those interventions uh, what is your experience uh, do you have any experience in mumbai on working on such uh, interventions or elsewhere yeah. in south asia uh yeah it well, actually was in 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 delhi as well and and i think but so one of the things, there's, there's two ways to look at this. One is that observation, if you look at the way Gell does things, for example, he's all about observation. How are people using space? How are they getting to this space? What do they do when they get there? Who are they interacting with? Is there just men? Is there just women? Is there different cultures? Is, you know, like the power of observation is inc incredibly important in, in placemaking because it also helps you look and say, well, everybody's going left, but the space they should be going to is on the right. So what's making them go to the left? Find out what's making them go to the left, take the ingredients from that and make them go right. And so beyond observation though, when you start to get involved with the, the stakeholder engagement, there's really, really some really simple tools. One that we use is a survey tool, like a, a place game where we're on site and we have 10 questions uh, framed around uh, what do the people see and do. And they're actually, they're, they're designed so that the community members can take them and we'll guide them, but the community members actually take them and fill them in themselves. Or if they can't fill them in, then we would fill it in for them. But they're just about helping them understand the value of the place that they have and things that they feel are missing. So I think there's lots of tools, but even if you were to step back further, perhaps the first tool is to talk to people, you know, observation and just talking to people. You go in and you see five shops that don't look successful and you see one shop that is successful, go in and ask him what he's done to make it successful. Um, and I think as designers, often the risk is that we look at a place and think we know better and we don't spend the time getting to know people and what their hopes, what their needs and wants are. And so if you build, for example, an amphitheater when everybody wants a cricket pitch, well, who's going to use the amphitheater? If you had talked to the people first and understood that what they really wanted was a place to play street cricket or, or a pitch, then you, know, you would understand it better. And I, like, I, I don't think where in the world it matters. I think it's all the same is that it, it, talking to people and, and you know, giving it context, sure, but just talking to people and trying to understand what it is they can't, like what, what it is they leave their community to get versus what you think they could get in their community. You know, this, this kind of question where, you know, if people, 
if people are leaving their community to go to another community to get something, why isn't it being supplied in my community? If people are saying, oh, I'll meet you at that park three neighborhoods away, what is it about the three neighborhoods prior that why is it that they don't have a park? And, and what could we do to get a park in there? And what could we do so that each of the parks had something different to offer people? So that we're not just providing the same thing over and over and over. And so I guess it's just that idea that, you know, design is important, but talking to people is actually more important and understanding how communities use the spaces that they have and then understanding where they feel there's a deficit and then working your design from that. So you come back to them and co-create solutions with them that address those needs. And I think that's every space I've seen that's failed has been because it's been top down designed. You know, it just, it, it's because it's not responding to the needs of the community. Um, so like I said, I don't think it matters where in the world I've done some awfully interesting consultations in far flung places of the world. And, and, and when, when people, actually going back to our point earlier, in fact, um, when people feel like it's, they're a part of it and like it's done for them for a reason, then they actually create that sense of owner, public uh, community ownership over, over a, a place that gives it the life that, that it needs to have to make it as an, an attractive place. And so I guess too, I was gonna, I was reflecting while you guys were talking about this idea of what to do about kind of homelessness is a hard issue, but a, a less difficult issue, I think, is probably litter, public defecation, things like this. Like there's, there's, there's a host of these kind of things, which are maybe perhaps easier to deal with in response to that question. And so last year, I presented in a lot of places around the world about creating places people love. And my proposition was that if you love something, you're not going to do something to harm it. And so creating a sense of community where everybody feels involved and a part of it means that if there is a piece of litter on the ground, they're going to pick it up and put it in the bin. If they have something in their hand which should go in a bin, then they're going to find a bin and, and, and you know, throw it away properly. If you create that sense of, of love and joy in the space where people don't want to harm it, they're more likely to actually invest in making it a better place. And I, I think that's really quite critical. And like I said, we can't address, we can't answer the homeless problem, which has much more systemic kind of issues, but we can address the idea of creating places people love as a way to create better places. Oh, thank you. Um, I think there is one question for Nidhi. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the question is, Nidhi, speaking as a Puneka, Delhi is a notorious for Ill illegal colonies stemming from a lack of rural bylaws as they merge into the city. What's the right approach to dealing with them from a placemaking perspective? Uh, I think uh, being illegal colonies, they are not left with any space to actually, you know, do the whole place making exercise. But for them, I think the street is the place, uh, like all the three presentations, I think the street is the place where, you know, they have their cricket rounds, where the groceries uh, um, are bought and, you know, the, uh, there are the radiwalas which go and all the women are on the street. So I think it's more about a streetscape exercise for these places, which have been done uh, in a few cases, I would say but uh, I don't have any live examples right now. But uh, yes, these uh, colonies are, I mean, uh, open to the ideas of, again, you know, but they don't have the money to invest, you know, they can just get their uh, houses in place because it's all uh, it got converted from an illegal colony. Maybe they get uh, sanctions at times to uh, make it a, a proper, uh, proper household uh, for them. So once the proper household is done, you know, then they actually wait for the uh, government to put in infrastructure for them. Even the roads at times are not laid uh, down properly. So once all those basic infrastructure exercises are done, I think then the placemaking uh, will also happen for them, which for, for uh, you know, uh, for a few, I would say they start uh, doing it from the uh, OTLA that, uh, you know, the uh, 
the steps uh, which are leading to the plinth they just decorate them and they start uh, putting the streetscape in place and uh, they start putting rangolis and you know the colorful facades of the houses actually give uh, rise to a nice uh, uh, streetscape so i think they can start from there and then the government initiative and the community uh, effort has to come in to put uh, the whole exercise into place Yes. I think Andy, you are quite right in that sense, you know, because my personal feeling is that if we have to see some uh, spontaneous place making, I think we should visit these slum colonies because okay. that's where you see how people they are the people who are the most connected as a community, you know, yes. because they know they have no one to fall back to, and they they have to be together. So I think they have some very very interesting, uh, you know, uh, self motivated initiatives for place making, you know, where they will build a small shrine and then they create a space for their, you know, maybe. Uh, the shera celebration or diwali celebration and such, such as a festival so i think uh, this is a very important point that that vinita has raised that you know uh, we uh, always uh, when we talk about place making we are always studying the bigger the landmark public spaces yes. but it is the these slum these uh, or colonies where people organize themselves you know they may be having a lot of issues in terms of infrastructure and other things but i think uh, some of the most uh, unique examples of place making can be found in those uh, particular areas i think uh, you know you should encourage some from your college uh, students to take up studies in this specific areas to you know document those uh, interesting you know, place making uh, initiatives not just in terms of the design aspect of it but how people get together the entire process of it you know right from fundraising to getting together and to the point of maintaining it also because There's there's no intervention from the government or support from the government in that sense for them. So yeah. it's all very very you know community based. Uh, so I think there is a lot of uh, learning in terms of both creation and maintenance and management of public spaces in such areas as well. Yeah, and uh, they are the ones I think they come up with the most affordable uh, solutions yes. because they are yes. they have the lack of funds. They don't have funds lying with them. So they are the most affordable and, I, and sustainable solutions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think when you are constrained, when you have limitations, it's only the creativity flourishes when you have these constraints. You know, when you have a lot of money, <laughs> you go into you know a very curated kind of experience. But I think this is where it is very spontaneous, very natural, and uh, rightly you know as you said, very affordable as well. So um, I think uh, I would now like to thank all the speakers for this very interesting presentation. i hope we could continue this discussion you know because one uh, question leads to the other and <laughs> there's so much to discuss uh, uh, so uh, thank you all of you thank you uh, nidhi thank you michael thank you adrat for uh, being on the session and i hope the audience also enjoyed this session um, uh, you know uh, so i would now just like to introduce about uh, a little bit with about the uh, session number 2 in the series of festival places Uh, the second uh, session is based on the idea of interaction and sociability in public spaces and the session is scheduled for 20th december 2020 uh, from 5 pm onwards uh, subject expert for the session are professor dr amit hajela director college of architecture vastukala academy gigi sip university new delhi uh, ms deepshika sinha urban designer and architect program coordinator rahagiri foundation and ms uh, subra puri founder of gurgaon first both will be representing radhri foundation ms smita mishra executive director tadavit foundation so these are the very you know interesting speakers who will be talking about interaction and sociability in public spaces specifically uh, we will be sharing the registration links for the same shortly uh, I, somya can you please share the uh, poster for the next session yes ma'am i'm doing that okay thank you thank can you can you so see much. my screen yeah 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 So uh, once again, I personally thank each one of you for your participation and support to the Festival of Places. Do log in to uh, our website, uh, IndiaHeritageHub.org, for our initiatives, uh, and look forward to meeting all of you again next Sunday, same time, same place. Until then, stay happy and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye.